It was back in the days before mobile phones. And I even mean before landlines had mobile handsets. The phone in the house had a place of its own. And in our home in Fermanagh, it was in the hall. And phones in those days even had their own furniture. A phone desk. I'm sure it's unheard of nowadays. But they had these things. Appropriate sized shelves for the phone book. And for the yellow pages. All a wee bit distant now with the electronic age. It meant, of course, that you couldn't take the phone upstairs. You couldn't take the phone into another room. It just wasn't mobile at all. And that kind of meant, especially in our own home, it wasn't private at all. And I remember the phone ringing while we were at the table, and Mum or Dad would get up to answer the phone. Uh, and the eight of us left at the table, uh, we would go silent. And the question in our minds was always, who is it? Who, who, who's calling? Uh, and of course, we couldn't hear the person on the other side of the phone call. Uh, all we could hear was mum or dad speaking. But from one side of the conversation, we would try and work out who the caller was. It was a bit of a game. Who would be the first one to guess the right person? And then we'd wait until the call was over, and mum or dad would come back in. And then, well, who got the right answer. Well tonight we're going to kind of do the same game. We're going to eavesdrop on Hannah as she prays uh, in the tabernacle. And really the question is the same. Who is it? Who is it that Hannah is talking to? And on one level the answer is simple enough because she's praying. She's talking to God. But as you know even in our day and age Lots of people pray. And to be honest, lots of people pray to lots of different so-called gods. If you listen to their prayers, you might think that their God just liked to hear the same prayer over and over and over again, word for word. What kind of God is that? Or perhaps every time they pray, it's to a different God. That's a wee bit harder for us to comprehend. Then there are prayers which are only ever, get me out of here, prayers. And at times we do pray them. But sometimes that's the only kind of prayer that a person prays. Yes, it reveals something of the one praying, but it also reveals something about the God that they are praying to. And so back to Hannah. Who is it? What's her God like? Seven times she names him in this prayer, using his name, Lord, all capital. This is Yahweh, the God of the Bible, the one true God. Well, who is he? What's he like? Well, let's listen in and we'll hear. Number one, he's the God who made a difference in Hannah's life. Verse one, and Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. This is real. And it's personal. It's a responsive, happy prayer because Hannah's happy. Her previous prayer in chapter 1 verse 11 has been answered. She so much wanted a son and now we Samuel's here. He's been born. And he's grown up a little bit. He's now weaned. He's three or four years old. And he's just been dropped off at the tabernacle into the care of Eli. And we saw into the care of the Lord. And we saw last time that this action, giving him over, was just total surrender to the Lord. And it was more than that. It was glad surrender. She's glad to commit her boy into the care of the Lord of hosts. And this prayer begins in verse 1 with much of the first person. My heart, my horn, I smile, I rejoice. It's not just that the Lord of hosts makes a difference in the world. He has made a difference in the life and times of Hannah. He's made a difference to her. Because of the Lord, her heart is changed. My heart rejoices 
in the Lord. What a change from verse 8 in chapter 1 when her heart was so heavy. Don't forget your maidservant. What a change in the description of her heart and soul to Eli in verse 15. There she said, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. Verse 16, my complaint and grief. Her very core, her innermost person, that all that is within me part of her has been changed by the Lord. And that's what's key here. Her heart rejoices in the Lord. Not her heart rejoices in the birth of Samuel or in the calling of Samuel. And I'm sure little Samuel made her heart leap for joy. But we're listening to her prayer here in verse 1. And the words that Hannah uses are not about her rejoicing in little Samuel. She's rejoicing in the Lord. She's rejoicing in the giver. And not just the gift. Yes, Samuel's arrival for sure has made a massive difference in her life. But her praise is given to the Lord, the giver. She goes on. My horn is exalted in the Lord. That is, her strength is increased. Uh, remember, this is why she surrenders everything to the Lord, including her boy Samuel. The world would not see that as strength. They would see it as weakness. But Hannah is empowered through her total submission to the Lord. Her horn, her strength is exalted in the Lord. That's the key here once again. Her strength, it's not her own strength. She's strong because she is in the Lord. His strength is made perfect in her weakness. And Hannah knows it. And she praises God for it. She smiles then at her enemies, or better translated in the King James, my mouth is enlarged. Now some see this enlargement uh, of the mouth as a smile at her enemies, a kind of smile of vindication where she's kind of almost rubbing it in the way it was rubbed into her. God has heard me. Others see this as an opening of her mouth to devour her enemies, the way a wolf or a lion would open its mouth to devour but I think it's best to see an, an open mouth as a speaking mouth. Even a singing mouth. We're taught to open it wide. Let it out. Open it up. Her enemies, and Penina comes to mind, had opened uh, her mouth against her for long enough. Now it's Hannah's turn to speak. What's she going to do? Hannah's going to sing. Hannah's going to pray. Before, while Penina goaded her, she just wanted to run away. And she did run away. But she ran away to the Lord. And he heard her prayer. And now she is running no more. God has now prepared a table for her in the presence of her enemies. And she's singing. And she's singing not only about the Lord uh, having given her a wonderful gift. And she's singing about that. No, she's singing about the Lord himself. She's praising the Lord. The mouth is open to praise him. Yes, it's clear that the Lord has made a huge difference in Hannah's life. Just listen to her. Her prayer begins with personal praise for the Lord himself. She's rejoicing in the Lord and rejoicing in his salvation. At the end of verse 1. And it's not that Hannah's life has been saved by the Lord giving her the son that she'd always wanted. But Hannah, I do believe, is already becoming aware that her boy is special. Her boy is going to be key in God's plans of salvation. He's going to play a crucial role in God's great overarching plan of redemption. Hannah doesn't know the details yet. But she knows it in her heart. God is up to something. He has given her this boy for a reason. 
And he has, take, uh, he has taken him from her into the tabernacle uh, for a reason. And Hannah, I do believe she's excited. What will happen next? See, Hannah knows that this is what the Lord does. He is the one who does not change. But he delights to reach into our world and make a difference. Hannah's prayer reveals that the Lord has already made a great difference in her life. Well, the question, the obvious question for us is, has he made a difference in your life? What about your heart? Is the joy of the Lord in it? Or is your heart so busy, is it filled with the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches? Has the Lord changed your heart? Is he changing your heart? Present tense. Is the Lord in your heart? And what about your strength? Maybe you're here tonight and you feel, I've got no strength left. And to be honest, I hope you've got none of your own strength left. Because only then will you cast yourself on the Lord like Hannah did in chapter 1. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10, For when I am weak, then I am strong. And as your mouth enlarged, if I was to overhear you pray, would I hear you rejoice in God's salvation? Can I be a little bit cheeky and ask, how big is your mouth? You see, maybe it's big at the football match. Maybe it's big at the concert. But is it big when it comes to rejoicing in your Lord and Saviour? Only the Lord can make the changes in a person. The Lord can make a difference in your life when you surrender all to him. And certainly for Hannah, when we hear her pray, we can say, yes, there's a godly woman and the Lord has made a difference. In her life. We keep listening in. Number two. Who is this? This is the God. Who has made himself known. Verses two and three. Uh, As we listen to Hannah. And hear her praise the Lord. It appears that she knows. The one uh, that she is talking to. These words are not. The self projected thoughts. Of a God of her own imagination. Her words tell us about the God who has made himself known to her. Verse 2. No one is holy like the Lord. And he is holy. And Hannah delights in the holiness of God. Remember it was when she went up to the tabernacle every year that Peninnah laid it on thick. And she rubbed salt in the wound of Hannah's barrenness. Peninnah was not holy. But the Lord is holy. He's not like others. And that otherness about God is something to be delighted in. In a world full of sin. In a world full of, well, where everyone does what is right in their own eyes. God is refreshingly different. He's refreshingly holy. He's pure. No one is holy like the Lord. She goes on for, there is none besides you. He is unique. Who else could Hannah turn to? Peninnah despised her. Elkanah, her husband, told her to cheer up. After all, she was married to him. What more could she want? Eli, he figured that she was a drunk. And please, no, do not go near his sons, Hophni and Phinehas. But she could turn to the Lord. Simon Peter said to Jesus in John 6, verse 68, Lord, to whom shall we go? You. And it's only him. You have the words of eternal life. There is none beside you. She goes on again, Nor is there any rock like our God. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4 says, He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of truth and without injustice, righteous. And upright is he. She delights in it. 
Verse 3, for the Lord is the God of knowledge. The Lord knows everything. He knows the end from the beginning. He knew the condition of Israel. He knew all about Peninnah's antics. He knew Elkanah's words. He knew Hannah. He knew Samuel. He knew that Samuel would soon enough anoint David. And in that line, he would send Jesus, his son, into the world to save his people from their sins. He knew it. Yes, we might like to pride ourselves in what we know. We might like to think that Google or Alexa have the answer to everything. But you know it's not the case. But the Lord's different. He truly does know everything. And he is not careless about what he does know. Verse 3 goes on. And by him actions are weighed. He sees it all, he knows it all, and he is the judge of all things. And it was the great judge who put the writing on the wall for King Belshazzar in Daniel's time. That word tekel, Daniel 5, 27. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And what was true of Belshazzar That's true of us this evening. Left to our own devices, left to our own righteousness, we're found wanting. We need the grace of God. And by God's grace, we'll listen to Hannah's words at the end of verse 3. Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. The Lord knows everything. Therefore, we should humble ourselves before him. And I say this to us as the Lord's people. We should stop pretending that we've got it all sorted. That we're all just doing fine. Hannah was in turmoil. She didn't put on a brave face and say to Peninnah in chapter 1, Well, that's true, I've got no children, but you know what? Elkanah loves me more than you, so there you have it. She couldn't do that. But knowing that the Lord knows everything. She went to the tabernacle. And she went to the Lord. And she went to pray knowing that God was holy. That he was the only God. That he is the rock. The all-knowing. The all-judging God. The one who cares. And she went knowing something else about the Lord. And it's the big thing really about this prayer. It's what we hear from her next in verses 4 to 9. Who is this? This is the God who delights to turn things around. Verse 4. The bows of the mighty men are broken and those who stumbled are girded with strength. I was ready to fall, Lord, but you heard me. I was at the end of myself, Lord, but you turned things around. It seemed like Peninnah was just going to triumph over my demise, but Lord, you turned it all on its head. Lord, I know this is what you do. Verse 5. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, and the hungry have ceased to hunger. Even the barren has borne seven, and she who has many children has become feeble. Imagine Hannah, even in this, entering into it. Lord, I was empty. She was full. But you turn things around. Skip down to verse 21 for a little preview. More children will soon be arriving. And even now, Hannah believes it. Because this is what God delights to do. She knows the one she's praying to. He delights to turn things around for his people. She loves that. He has done it for her personally. And she keeps on singing, keeps on praying. In verses 6 to 8. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. 
He brings low and lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. Remember, all of these uh, turnarounds, they are subject to God's holiness and uniqueness and dependability and omniscience and judgment. He makes no mistakes. And I wonder where, where are you in these verses 6 to 8? For those who are bereaved, missing loved ones, the Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. He loves to do it and he will do it. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Maybe you're feeling done. You have nothing left to offer. You have nothing left to give. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. Therefore we trust him and we go to him and we surrender to him all over again. Maybe you're hitting the bottom of life, feeling so very low. What does this God do? Yes, he brings low and lifts up. You don't need an Elkanah in your life telling you how much you've got to be thankful for, but you do need the Lord to lift you up. And he delights to lift us up. He can pull you out of the miry clay and set your feet upon a rock what he does and maybe just maybe you're thinking that your sin is just too shameful for God to cope with too shameful for you even to draw near to God you're thinking it's just the ice sheep for me come to me says the Lord and I'll turn your life around because that is what I love to do I raise the poor from the dust and I lift the beggar from the ice sheep And I set them among princes and I make them to inherit the throne of glory. He reminds us that the earth is his. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. I'm in control, says the Lord. Two things that means. Don't ever feel too proud to come to me. Because I kill and I bring people down and I make poor and I bring low. But don't ever feel that you're too far gone. That I can't turn you around. Because I make dead people live. I raise up. I make rich. I exalt people and I I bring them to my throne of grace. so many things I think in our lives that we maybe do genuinely want to see turned around and we can't do it and I think very often our natural tendency is to is to worry about them and we'll fret about them and we'll make ourselves sick over them yet all the while God is saying come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest I will turn your life around because that's who I am. That's what I do. Hannah reassures us in verse 9. He will guard the feet of his saints but the wicked shall be silent in darkness for by strength no man shall prevail. You can't do it. You can't turn your own life around. No matter how much you try you just cannot do it. God says surrender to me and I will do it oh her prayer it is a joy to listen to one more thing we can learn about the God that she has surrendered to very briefly he is the God who has promised a king verse 10 not only will God give strength to all who surrender their lives to him He will do it through his anointed king. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. 
This is how God makes a difference in our lives. This is how God makes himself known. This is how God turns things around in our own lives and in history itself. It's all through Jesus, his king. Jesus will come and the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. When Jesus comes, death will be defeated. The power of sin will be destroyed. Jesus, once made poor, once brought low, once killed, once put in the grave, will be risen, alive, exalted, and highly exalted. Because I love to do it, says the Lord. I love to turn things around. But you must surrender to my son, Jesus. Hannah probably didn't know exactly how the fullness of this prophecy prayer at the end uh, would come to pass. But in the goodness of God, we know. And that's because the Lord kept his promise. And he did send the king. And it's through him. Your life and mine can be transformed, turned around. It's through Jesus that you and I can know this great God. It's through Jesus that God can make a real difference in your life. But you must bow in absolute surrender before him. Because of who he is. He's the king. Pray, please.